The condemned, in a silence broken only by the tramp of their heavy clogs, advance well guarded by the bayonets of the black Senegalese. They are wearing the grey convict uniform and carry on their shoulders a regulation kit bag. The convicts are wearing a black bonnet and the relegate, those who are doomed to perpetual exile, a soft felt. All have the same haggard look. In vain, we try to put a name on their faces. Those who yesterday were called Goudavin, Dr. Laguet, are today only a number. The real punishment starts at this moment. In turn, each boat comes alongside the great white ship, now rolling gently on the waves. One by one, the convict go up the ladder and disappear in the hold, where the steel cages, similar to those of a menagerie, will receive them for many long days. and prisoners confined like animals wait day after day. Their destination a forsaken corner of the earth, lost in the sea, an island of the devil. Keep up! Uh, Get up! Uh, it's right. Someday we'll be able to watch you rotting in hell. For me. The day we were condemned, we all died. It's only ten years of forced labor. It'll pass, and I want to live. But they condemned me to life in prison. There's no hope for me. Women prisoners confined like animals wait day after day. Their destination a forsaken corner of the earth, lost in the sea, an island of the devil. Keep up! Uh, Get up! Uh, it's right. Someday we'll be able to watch you rotting in hell. Beautiful and desperate, these women nurse their illusions of false hopes, their futile efforts to escape. If I kill you, it will be just another one of those crimes your friends have saddled me with. You will die from the hatred of your fellow prisoners. No. That's a lie. He fired when we were surrounded by the soldiers. Not one of us could possibly have escaped. That's a strong accusation, Lute. There is no escape from these soulless men in uniform, these guardians of Devil's Island and its accursed treasure that nourishes the greed of these men without scruples or compassion. This 
devil's gold. Passions primitive and violent explode like an earthquake and shake this island of tyranny to the depths of hell. Damn you, damn your eyes. Come back here, you wench. Out of a common destiny of blood and suffering is born the hope of freedom. Devil's Island. Dun, 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 dun. This is where they get the maximum security prisoners. The murderers. The political prisoners. This is where they were kept. And you can tell a huge ripping current right between the two islands. 
probably even see it on here, made it impossible to swim off. We were as good as dead. We stayed there forever. Sweep all the way around the coast, could be dropped. Freaking look at that little bag, how gorgeous is that? Using these towers, the French were able to communicate between the island and the mainland. It was a brutal place in a brutal climate, run by often sadistic and over-alcoholed guards. The prisoners were assigned to forced hard labor in sweltering heat and humidity. Of the 80,000 prisoners assigned here, only 30,000 ever survived. Since Devil's Island is only three degrees from the equator, the rains here are torrential and often. First constructed in 1852, the prison was built on an inhospitable group of rocky islands lying seven miles off the coast of mainland French Guyana. The inmates interned on the islands were convicted murderers, thieves and political prisoners. Up to 80,000 convicts were sentenced there until its closure in 1946 many of them dying in the harsh, disease-ridden conditions. The only access to the island was by boat across the rough and unpredictable waters from the mainland, and few prisoners ever escaped. Among the escapees, perhaps the most famous was Henri Charrier, better known as Papillon, from the book detailing his exploits. In his book, Charrier claims to have escaped by jumping off a cliff with two sacks full of coconuts. But official French records cast doubt that he was ever interned on the island and was actually imprisoned on the mainland. On the northern coast of South America lies the colony of French Guiana. A quiet backwater, this small French outpost has been nearly forgotten by the rest of the world. Until the middle of the 20th century, this country existed mainly as a giant prison. Most people knew it as Devil's Island. From 1852 to 1947, men were sent here in chains. All were condemned to serve harsh sentences. Some faced the ultimate punishment. Over 70,000 convicts were eventually banished to the prison colony of French Guiana. I hope that God reserves them a place in heaven. Devil's Island itself was the infamous home of France's most feared political prisoners. 
But what the world thought was just an island was actually a vast system of cruel prisons spread throughout French Guiana. The largest camp was on the mainland in the prison city of Saint Laurent. This was where the convicts first arrived and where the majority of them served their sentences. The once formidable prison is today an abandoned ruin. Its cells deserted. But some of its long gone inmates have become legendary. Society had no intentions of helping me, of bothering to find out if I was worth salvaging. The world had cast me beyond the reach of hope, into a hole like this, where they had only one thing on their minds, to kill me off, no matter what. Henri Papillon Chayère. Determined to escape, he made his first attempt in an open boat, sailing 1,800 miles to Venezuela. But he was ultimately captured by the Venezuelan police and sent back to French Guiana. The prison authorities had little patience for Papillon, and he was condemned to two years in solitary confinement. Any other civilized nation would have given us a chance to remake our lives instead of sending us to death. Some of us committed the first felony in an excess of folly, and we are in no sense criminals. Now we are locked up like animals in close quarters with assassins and thieves. We are men who have energy and self-respect, and the confinement goes hard with our temperament. René Belbenois. With scores of other convicts embarks on the 5,000 mile voyage to South America. He is one of 70,000 prisoners sentenced to French Guiana between 1854 and 1946. He becomes just another statistic in the remote facility reputed to be the most feared prison on earth. On the French Guiana mainland, convicts are worked to exhaustion in the savage tropical heat. The blade, corroded to dullness by tropical humidity, sometimes needs to be dropped twice to sever a head from a body. But a convict's more immediate fears are the barbaric labor camps and the disease-ridden jungle environment. 90% of those condemned here will perish before completing their sentences. The barbarism of French Guiana is a bitter paradox considering the enlightened nation which produced it. France was the most open and liberal government in Europe, and yet it established the most ferocious penal system. Convict hoped to escape. He had an enormous number of challenges before him. The first was simply to get away from the guards that prey on people. There were uh, Indians in the interior, uh, not many of whom were very friendly. Very few people who tried to escape through the jungle survived. If an escape attempt by land is considered suicide, so too is any effort to escape by sea. It is all but impossible for any convict to acquire a craft much larger than a rowboat. Often rotting and equipped only with makeshift sails, they are no match for the hazardous currents along the coast. Smuggled into French Guiana, the one resource needed to make it possible. Cash was critical to arrange any escape. Guards could be bribed. Free colonists could be bribed. Boats could be bought. And all of this required cash. Many criminals would hide cash in a small tube which they would insert into their rectum and then up into the lower intestine. The guards were not eager to engage in what we today call body cavity searches. Captured escapees often spent six months in the much feared blockhouse as they awaited trial before a special maritime tribunal. The blockhouse was a place of exceptional cruelty. 
Each night, the prisoner's legs would be shackled to a long iron rod. Scratched on the walls, graffiti still counts off the endless days of waiting. Some of the men were walking skeletons. Breathing the hot, tainted air makes them anemic. They suffer from cholera, hookworm, and malaria. Many of them will be dead when the day of their trial arrives. René Balbenois. French justice was harsh and often pitiless. A convict's journey through the depths of hell began the day he was sentenced to servitude in Guyana. Prisoners from jails all over France were transferred to the town of Saint-Martin on the northern French coast. Twice a year, a column of condemned souls would march from Saint-Martin's prison to the pier. Specially trained Senegalese troops in combat uniforms and with fixed bayonets guarded the convicts as they walked through the town. Since these were men with little to lose, French authorities feared a mass insurrection. Most went peacefully. 
others did not. The column moved slowly forward. Policemen held back the curious who had gathered to watch our departure. I looked up, and there was my wife, Nanette. I never saw her again. Neither prisoners, guards, nor public broke in on this poignant moment. Everyone understood that these men were leaving a normal life behind forever. Henri Papillon Charrière. The prisoners clambered aboard a transatlantic steamer called the Martinier. Like cattle, the men were forced into the hull of the ship. Once inside the holding cells, only a few hammocks were issued. Those without were forced to sleep on the steel floor, which was often covered in human excrement. There was always a tremendous fear by the prison guards that there would be an insurrection aboard the ship. Any time an insurrection was about to foment, guards opened up steam hoses. For half an hour each day, the prisoners were allowed out of their cages for fresh air. They had been stripped of all personal possessions and wore only prison uniforms. But they did have a secret way to hide valuables. Money and jewels were kept in small hollow tubes called plans. After a journey of 20 torturous days across the Atlantic, the convict ship arrived at the mouth of the Moroni River, entrance point to the prison colony of French Guiana. We steamed slowly along the bank toward Saint Laurent. We all flocked to the portholes of the cage. There were exclamations of many kinds. Look, look over there, monkeys. Look, a parrot flying. As I gazed out at the green jungle, its immensity frightened me, for I knew through it I'd have to take my chance to escape. René Belbenois. The Martinier pulled into the dock at Saint Laurent. Many of the town's residents were there to get a glimpse of the new arrivals. It was the only amusement in this bizarre town on the edge of the rainforest. After the material cargo had been removed from the ship, the human cargo of convicts was marched toward the prison. In French slang, it was known as Le Bonne. There was a huge gate. Over the opening, I read in large letters, Camp de la Transportation. It's the Bagne, the men behind me murmured in a voice that was robbed of all hope. So this is where I live until I die. The newly arrived convicts were assembled in the prison's large central courtyard. The commandant of the penitentiary made his traditional welcoming speech. You have been brought to the prison colony of French Guiana, he said, to serve sentences for crimes committed against France. Behave yourselves, and it will be possible to serve your term without suffering unduly. First escape attempt, add two years to your sentence. Second attempt, add five more. A few days later, our names were entered on the roll. Belbenoit, René. 46635. The figures burned like a brand in my mind. I was the 46,635th condemned man who had arrived in Guyana since 1852. The 
city of Saint Laurent, where Belvenois was kept, existed solely as a prison city. Each morning, the convicts would leave the compound and go to work in town. Prisoners kept the streets eerily spotless, the little houses freshly painted. Convict labor helped make Saint Laurent live up to its nickname, Little Paris. They raised animals and farmed, built roads and houses, all different chores. Then, after 17 or 18 hours of work, they returned to the main entrance of the prison and were searched for weapons. At night, they were locked up in barracks that held up to 60 men. The guards rarely ventured into this world. It was a place of alcoholism, rape, violence, and fear. Classification of prisoners were called relegues. Relegues were petty offenders, prisoners who had been sentenced for bicycle theft, for stealing food. Convict sentenced to life in prison does not want to have anything to do with the relegue. The relegue was considered garbage. And struggled each day to stay alive. In the capital city of Cayenne, a libere band played for meager tips in a cafe. If you are a citizen of Guyana that owns a small business, you can have, for a modest fee to the penitentiary administration, convicts to work for you. The last category of prisoners were the incos, or the incorrigibles. These were men with unbroken wills, men who rebelled against their captors. 
But once labeled incorrigible, a prisoner was destined to a fate that was very likely to kill him. He would be sent to the much-feared jungle camps. Men accustomed to city life in the temperate zone were put to work chopping down huge trees in the heart of the tropics. Half would quickly break and die. To the administration, the men are things to be disposed of. René Belbenois. Disease would eat away at the prisoners. Malaria, typhus, and yellow fever quickly drained the population. At night, the men were locked in cage-like cells deep in the forest. Here, they were in constant fear of predators venomous spiders, deadly snakes, poisonous centipedes, and vampire bats that sucked the blood of sleeping convicts. Although many tried to escape, very few succeeded. And a recaptured convict might have a fate even worse than the jungle camps. The Islands of Salvation. A cluster of three islands, nine miles off the coast of French Guiana, this was the final home to hundreds of the most hardened prisoners. Royale, the biggest island, housed the island prison's administration and also held over 400 convicts. Here, life was an endless repetition. The bell that strikes at dawn to awaken the sleeping man is the one that strikes at dusk, recalling us to ourselves. The sound of the bell punctuates our routines. We live by its tolling. Another day, no different from any other. This is prison life. Francis Lagrange. Francis Lagrange, who was sentenced to life imprisonment, claimed to be one of the great art forgers and counterfeiters of modern times. Though he was known to be a compulsive liar, one fact is indisputable. He was a talented painter. Following time spent in solitary confinement, Lagrange began to paint religious scenes on the walls of the chapel on Royale. But alone in his cell, he also created a series of vivid images of life in the prison colony. I think it really accurately portrays not only just the physical environment, but the agony of many of the prisoners. Take a look at the prisoner with the double leg irons. There he is in solitary confinement with a stub of a cigarette from his mouth. Or think about the prisoners attached, fighting with knives, probably over a homosexual lover's quarrel. He was telling the world it was a way that the French government had decided to just get rid of people without thinking about the future or the past. Across a narrow strait from Royale is St. Joseph Island. Half a century ago, this was home to the reclusion or solitary confinement cells. Rebellious convicts and captured escapees were sent to this maximum security prison. Damp and moldy cells were only nine feet by 12. The grilled ceiling allowed guards to watch the prisoners from an overhead catwalk. If you lifted up your head to look at a guard, you felt like a leopard in a pit, being watched by the hunter who had just caught you. It took me months to get used to that awful sensation. The men who planned this place must have been loathsome monsters. Henri Papillon Chayer. St. Joseph was known as the Island of Silence. The prisoners were absolutely forbidden to talk. 
Food served once a day in a small bucket supplied only a minimum of nourishment. It was here men came to die a slow death. There's a small cemetery on St. Joseph. It was for the unfortunate families of the guards. Children who died of fever. Wives who died in childbirth. But there was no cemetery for the prisoners. When a convict died, the body was rowed out to a point between Royale and St. Joseph Islands and unceremoniously dumped into the sea. Almost instantly, sharks, long accustomed to the taste of human flesh, devoured the corpse. Eventually, the sharks themselves were caught and fed to the prisoners, completing a gruesome food chain. The final island that made up this nightmare prison colony was Devil's Island. It acquired its ominous name when the local Amerindians found it inaccessible because of treacherous currents. That made the island ideal for isolating some of France's most feared political prisoners. Fewer than 50 men were ever imprisoned on Devil's Island. The island is only about 1,200 yards in circumference, and one can almost circle it while smoking a cigarette. It looks like a paradise, all covered with palms. But in reality, it is an island hell where many poor souls suffer eternally in torment. René Belbenois. Alone on the island, except for a contingent of guards, Dreyfus was kept in a stone hut on the edge of the sea. Confined to his hut, his mail heavily censored, on the northern tip of Devil's Island is a bench made of stone. It is said that in the days before he was confined to his hut, Captain Dreyfus would sit here for hours and stare out in the direction of France. In 1899, a new trial was granted, and after four years on Devil's Island, Dreyfus returned to France.
Non, on ne croit pas. Il faut être avec tout le monde. In French Guiana, there was only one thing worse than imprisonment on the islands of salvation. The guillotine. Nicknamed the Merry Widow, the guillotine was assembled often in Saint Laurent. Killing a guard or a civilian was almost always followed by a death sentence. The condemned man's fellow convicts were forced to witness the execution. Prisoner volunteers acted as executioners, and they were often the most despised men in the colony. Henri Clausio was hated by the prisoners. More than three quarters of the prisoners in French Guiana would attempt escape. There were only a few ways to do this, all dangerous. Escape through the jungle, almost an impossibility. The convicts become prey to it and perish. Escape by way of Dutch Guiana, must have been hunted down and sent back to Saint Laurent. But there is the great and magnificent way of the sea, and this is the most dangerous of all. René Belbenois. In Hollywood, Belbenois became a technical consultant on several movies about Devil's Island, like Passage to Marseille, which starred Humphrey Bogart. The courageous saga of a band of heroic outcasts Want to come back to fight for the land that had disowned them. On November 22, 1938, the Martiniere left France with 600 convicts. It was the last convoy ever to French Guiana. World War II brought German occupation and misery to France. U.S. troops entered French Guiana to prevent it from becoming a Nazi beachhead. And though cut off from the world, the prison system continued to operate. By 1947, the last of the convicts was freed. Most returned to France. Ils avaient de très grandes difficultés personnelles. They had a lot of trouble reintegrating into modern society because these men had acquired habits that were incompatible with the French way of life. Three hundred ex-convicts chose to stay in French Guiana. They had been away from France for so long that this was now their home. By 1965, less than a hundred of them were still alive. That year, Dr. Roger Pradineau was assigned to the hospital in Saint Laurent. His home movies of the ex-convicts are some of the last remaining images of these condemned souls.
French Guiana today looks upward to the heavens for its salvation. Six, cinq, quatre, trois, deux, un, feu. The European Space Agency launches Ariane rockets from a site across from the islands of salvation. Luxury cruise ships now make stopovers at Royale. Where there were once grotesque cells of despair, there are now tourists strolling leisurely through the ruins. And a restaurant now caters to customers who can enjoy a picturesque view of Devil's Island. How did such a diabolical place come to be? Ironically, early in its history, French Guiana held promise. It's thought that Christopher Columbus noticed the coastline on one of his voyages to the New World. But it wasn't until the early 17th century that the region was first claimed by French explorers. Soon there were rumors of a giant city in the interior made of gold called El Dorado. In 1763, an official call went out to find settlers for this supposed paradise. Entire French villages emptied of their inhabitants as they departed for a new life across the Atlantic. But catastrophe quickly struck the ill-prepared colonists. Tropical diseases began to decimate the population. Within the first year, over 12,000 settlers had died. Those who survived fled to three offshore islands. They dubbed it the Islands of Salvation because the death rate dropped very, very quickly. This was a colony of the damned. Over the next 80 years, others would try to settle this inhospitable country, but all efforts failed. In 1852, Emperor Louis Napoleon III devised a plan to settle French Guiana, and at the same time, combat a severe crime problem at home. His idea was to send Francis criminals to the distant South American possession. Regulations were established for this new prison colony including the concept of doublage. Doublage required a convict who had finished serving his sentence to remain in French Guiana for an equal period of time. The first convicts were sent in 1852, and it wasn't long before female convicts were sent as well. Over a thousand women were transported to the prison camp. The authorities ended the transport of women in 1903.
fâché, si pour être la case, pas ce mot malade ou sans mot qu'à souffrir. Pas rien dit des citrouilles, pas rien dit chauffage ou à et où ça, ça qu'a manqué mot. Même si vous fâché, faut pas oublier mot, ou qu'a manqué mot, oui ou ça tout mot job. Le bras changé d'ici au roi, qui toujours fait mot dit bien, et qu'on caresse. Car réchauffer mon mon gain la vie mon cas toussé au choc arraché mon cas songé tout ici roi oui toute la nuit à mon cas souffrir au choc arraché mon cas songé tout ici roi doudou of the damned. The most feared place on earth. 